Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 284 for Monday, December 14th, 2020. Welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. As usual, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napoma, California, it's Paul Kent. <sighs> well, uh, I played this week, Paul. How is that possible, Dave? <laughs> I played a live stream this week. Mm, that's yeah, how it's possible. That's how it's possible, my friend. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, the the folks at the, the theater where I... I do work and stuff uh, had pulled together this holiday variety show ish kind of thing. And uh, I, I, the, they, they were going to just keep using the the band that they had had for like another show, winter wonderettes. And that all got changed because of COVID or whatever. And so Dave, can you play? I was like, sure. And uh, they said, Oh, it's organized like a madhouse. So, you know, I'm like, great. I know how to do that. You know, I know how to approach that. Great. Okay, Good. And they gave me the script, which is like a madhouse that they wrote up and the songs are in the middle of the script. I'm like, yep. Okay. Got, got it. Good. Okay. First rehearsal on Friday, gig Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday or something. So we've played our first uh, live stream last night. So thankfully though, Paul, I chose be, just be based on my schedule. Usually for a madhouse, what I will do is I will sit down for, you know, two hours, the morning of the first rehearsal and go through all the tunes, map out the things I need to map out while I'm listening, you know, play through it a little bit and, and I'm good. Right. That's, that's just, I've got a formula and it works. We get through the rehearsal after the rehearsal. I do some more tooling on my own, show up, play the gig. Everything's good. Thankfully, I didn't think that I would have time necessarily on Friday morning to do this. So I did this on Wednesday, uh, right after I'd, you know, kind of gotten everything. And these are, songs that they have chosen are hard and it took some extra time for me because it's, it's a lot of like Christmas tunes in the vein of like, there's some big swing stuff. There's, uh, you know, tunes like, uh, 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 Brian Setzer's getting in the mood for Christmas, which is his twist on Glenn Miller's in the mood. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And it's like, th there's some hits in that song that are not necessarily easy and, you know, needed to be worked out. We're doing, um, Harry Connick's Frosty the Sto Snowman, which, I, I mean, like, talk about cooking. That tune moves, and it's got a really weird groove. And I was like, okay, I need to learn this. You know, this isn't just a thing where it's like, okay, you know, we're playing a Rolling Stones song. Like, verse, chorus, <laughs> verse, chorus, chorus, end. Like, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, great, no problem. Two, four, no problem. Um, like, what's the, uh, this is another one we're doing, that Tom Hanks thing from that Polar Express, a tune called Hot Chocolate, which is at like, you know, 100, 180 BPM or something like. You guys are at the grown-ups table. This is not like. This is the, like, yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. It's the grown-ups table. And it was like, holy crap. And, and then I get there <laughs> on Friday and I'm like, you guys said this is like a madhouse, but the, like there's, there's six or eight tunes here that are way harder than anything we've ever attempted and lots of breaks and stops and hits and like important things to, you know, get right. Sure. And I, I, I just casually said, I don't know how we plan to do this with just one rehearsal and our sound engineer who's there, like, you know, wiring up my drums after I set them up. He's like, well, that's why we have rehearsals Saturday and Sunday too. I'm like, nobody told me about any of this. And uh, they're like, oh, weren't you on the scheduling? He's like, it was in the scheduling email. I'm like, I've got no scheduling emails. I wasn't the guy for this gig. And uh, that's when our stage manager was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Right. You know, okay, let's compare schedules. What can you do? And I couldn't do Saturday because we had a family thing that would have been bad for me to, you know, I mean, the family would have understood, but still it was like, you know, no. Uh, yep. But I, I did rearrange Sunday and made it to, uh, you know, one of the other rehearsals. And we, we you know, the, it was interesting. So we, we made it through it actually. And like, we got it to where we can play these songs. The problem was that by last night, everybody was exhausted. I had a, I had a personally had a full day. I recorded my Mac Geek Gab podcast in the morning. Then we did this rehearsal. Then we, then actually I had another little family thing. And then we, um, then we played the gig uh, live streamed, of course. 
And after we finished the first set, first act, whatever you're supposed to call it in theater, I always just call things sets because, you know, that's how I think about stuff. I'm sure like <laughs> you, <laughs> they, they always laugh at me. But uh, after we finished the first set, I was like, okay, like we phoned that in. Like we played everything, but there was no energy that like we weren't playing the show. The show was sort of playing us. You know, we were playing along with the show. And I, I joked, I said, okay, this is the moment where if it was a rock gig, I'd take the band, go to the bar, buy everybody a round of drinks, loosen everybody up. You know, here we go. We got to go like, forget what just happened. It was fine. We didn't make any terrible mistakes or anything. It just was, you know, sort of, I, I felt like it was flat and, and sort of the rest of the band. And uh, I said, well, you know, we're not supposed to drink here in the theater. So uh, we just got to pretend, you know, that we, we got to get the energy up. <laughs> this is this is what's happening. And, you know, our guitar player sitting there like with his eyes closed, sitting in his chair. I'm like, this isn't going to work, Dave. Our guitar player's name is Dave, too. And um, so we got everybody's energy up and we did. I, we we killed it during the uh, during the second set. So, um, nice. yeah, yeah, it was good. The second set is the one with with most of the hard tunes. The the sets or tune ends the first set and then and then the rest of the I mean, there's there's tough stuff throughout. We're doing this um, version of Jingle Bells that I is. Um, oh, who is it that did it? It was. Why can't I think? Oh, who did it? Uh, I want to say Bette Midler, but I'm very, very wrong on that. Uh, but it's this crazy, like jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Well, what, you know, it's like this really mm -hmm. weird, frantic, manic thing. And, um, so that's in there. Joy to the world's in there. That's actually pretty easy though. You know, all things considered. <laughs> you know, we did a, a Christmas show a couple years in a row that it was the first time my first experience with a ticketed show that I produced myself right. at the house rockers right. yeah, yeah. in the early years. And, um, we took a lot of it from, from Setzer, you know, because we were doing some Setzer sure. stuff back then. Sure. Um, but you know, there's there was a kind of unique challenge of taking fifteen horns and you know putting the arrangements down to five, not quite the same. And we took like the Asbury Jukes holiday show and mm -hmm. took some arrangements for that. But you know, the Setzer stuff is a little weirder, you know, because he puts in a lot of jazz feels to him. That's just right. Setzer. The you know the the Jukes stuff was pretty blues you know it was yeah. pretty easy to get but you know the stuff you're talking about i was thinking when you were talking about that that harry Connick oh stuff. dude do you remember do you remember that video we were sharing <laughs> uh, where he where the band turns or the people clap on one and three and he has to turn the band around yeah he plays a measure of five yeah amazing amazing oh, and the I'll, band doesn't miss it no I mean, he he, just, he gives up he gives the high sign to the drummer and it, it, it's clear that they've had this conversation in the past, right? Like they know what's going to happen because Harry just right. can't deal when people are clapping on the one and the three. And he plays that measure of five. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, but to and the she, naked eye, it looks pretty no, seamless. It's I mean, right sudden, there. It, and you can see his percussionist like cheering the band on <laughs> after this happens. Like he's like, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's he, on the he's two the real deal. He's Oh, a, he's yeah. A he's, He's a real jazz player. I, that that groove, you know, and that Frosty the Snowman, it's a, I mean, it's like a, a twist on a second line kind of groove or whatever, but it's one of those things where it's like, there's no way in two days I'm going to cop what, I'm going to play exactly what that drummer played. It's right. like, let me hear the feel. And it, you know, the whole thing with that, with, with, um, with Madhouses, is it about, do, do people come because they're going to see some remarkable um, musicianship. I mean, is that the is that the appeal, or is is it the the? I mean, do you always uh, uh, try difficult things on short notice, and that's what the vibe is? Um, not no, no, you're not usually. I mean, we have done some madhouses that were extremely difficult and paid off really well. Like the the one we did for where we did a bunch of Queen tunes. I, I don't know that we'll ever top that. It was the right material for the right group of people, you know, the right musicians, the right singers. And, uh, and it really like, it was over the top. We did Bohemian Rhapsody. No one in it ever should be able to pull that off. Like Queen didn't even pull that off live. They, they took the middle section and would track it because they didn't have, you know, 15 voices to do right. the whole thing. And, and we just did it. So, and it worked really well. In fact, <laughs> so uh, it has happened in the past, but it's not usually the thing, but there are some times, but this one, so this one wasn't built by the, the guys that usually build these. This is built by uh, my friend, Jason Feria, who's playing the lead in this. Uh, he is he, one of the leading characters in Madhouse, but he's not the person who writes the script. He wrote this show. 
And so he didn't think about it from that standpoint. I don't think he's a great piano player. So he is a musician uh, as well as a singer and a dancer and a great actor and all, you know, all of these things. But, um, but I, I don't think he was thinking about how, you know, the difficulty level of the material at all. Uh, it was just like, yeah, here's all, here's all these tunes and they're great songs. We should play them. It's like, yeah, they're great songs. Holy crap. <laughs> you know, but it was fun. Um, one nice thing about live streaming, Paul, and I'm really now becoming quite bullish on this is uh, our sound engineer said, I'm, I'm going to stereo mic your, your drums. I'm going to put, you know, uh, two overheads up instead of one. When it's just in the theater, there's no reason to stereo mic things. You know, one, one overhead is more than enough. But uh, but for the live stream, it makes perfect sense. And he said, and, you know, if you want, you can do stereo in-ears. And I was like, yes. First of all, the Mackie X32 board, I've never done stereo in-ears from this. You can do it. You 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 bond two outputs, uh, you know, two aux outs together, and, uh, and then they become your stereo channel, and all that works. They, out of the gate, they inherit the stereo panning of the main mix. There is no way that we could find on the board or on the iPad app for the board to change the panning of just the output. The only place we could find to do it was by downloading the monitor app onto the phone or the iPad, the, the M32 or X32Q app, or I think it's only the M32Q app. They're the same. And, uh, and there we could change the panning of just my output as opposed to not, you know, changing the, the house mix mm -hmm. or whatever. But I, I'll tell you, Paul, I, I really think, st I, you know, with Fling, I always did stereo monitors because it was easy to do with our board and uh, we had the channels. And so I just did it. But I, the, the, you know, I've got over the last couple of years, I've done mono mixes and stereo mixes. The mono mixes, it gets really tough, especially, you know, in a rock band setting because everything just sort of mashes together and becomes mm -hmm. mud. I think especially for you and, you know, the, the difficulty that you you've had sort of embr fully embracing in ears, I, try the stereo thing. If you've got an extra channel on the board, rearrange things, do whatever you can to yeah. grab, you know, to grab that extra channel and try a stereo mix. I, I realized I never take an ear out when I've got a stereo mix going. And it, and, and the, you know, with a mono mix, it's an, it's often where it's like, I need to hear more of the space and it's not just the stereo drums. In fact, I think, well, I'm sure I've done stereo drums before, but like with fling, I don't, you know, there's no reason in a small club to do stereo drums, or at least maybe there is, we don't do it. Yep. Um, but, uh, but just being able to take, you know, uh, vocals and pan them, you know, I pan everybody else a little bit, right. I pan me a little bit left. I take our keyboards and I pan those to the right. I take one guitar left, one guitar right a little bit and just map out this sonic space, you know, and it's not a right, left and center. Isn't this, you know, three way thing. There's, you know, it's an analog ish thing where you yeah. can put things in different spots and just having that soundscape out there. It lets me hear everything much clearer at a much lower volume, uh, and it's truly pleasant, you know, and then like when our organist comes in and, and is playing something on a like Leslie sound, that's actually stereo. It's like, oh, my gosh, this sounds amazing. <laughs> but I really uh, highly, highly recommend the stereo in your stereo. I'll go back in and then we do have the channels, you know, so we yeah. you know that minus 32. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. We've got them. So if you've so got that I Midas 32, you have the same problem that I have with the Behringer because they're the same board. I said Mackie. I, it's not the Mackie X32. The Mackie is super easy for this. I, I should have said Behringer. I was trying to type and, uh, and talk at the same time. It's the Behringer Midas are the, the, the boards that are – it. There, there are different preamps in the Midas uh, and mm -hmm. a couple of extra features. But in terms of the mixing paths and all of that, they're the same. And so the only way you're going to be able to set your stereo pans is by using the M32Q app. So I'm I'm glad you said Midas because otherwise I would have left Mackie in there and been wrong. So sure, yeah. Um, we have we have uh we have a a letter from Michael and we have a sponsor I want to tell you about and we have a topic that you want to tell us about. So I'm going to tell us about Michael's letter first, if that's okay. Bring it. All right. Cool. Uh, it was just a quick follow up to last week. He was talking about where we were talking about our, our gift guide and he uh, replied to our comment, my comment about the iPad clamp that I have from Stage Ninja. 
and he recommends a clamp from Charger City. It's a heavy-duty four-way multi-adjust aluminum alloy pole bar music mic stand clamp mount for iPad. Uh, there's probably more to it than that, but that's that's more <laughs> than enough. Uh, and what's cool about this thing is that it really has it's it. So whereas the Stage Ninja clamp is, I love it because it's just this. I, I, it's a it's one. There's no adjustments to make. You just move it and it stays. But it can move around, especially if you whack it, it will move and stay where you've moved it. Just the way these, the, their, their arm works, this sort of infinitely adjustable arm. Uh, the charger city one has, I don't know, four or five different adjustment points, and then you lock them in and they stay where things are. So if you, if you have a real like strict setup where you need your iPad to be in a very specific spot, this might be the answer for you. And we'll of course put a link in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com. So did you check that thing out that he sent in? I mean, it, it looks, it looks a little crazy, but you know, it, it, it would, I didn't check it out. And I, the reason I didn't check it out is while we were having that conversation last week, I had on order an iClip three. Ah, and so, okay. yeah, so, <laughs> so I knew that was where I was going. So I didn't want to second guess my, you, no, you don't want post-purchase blues, man. That's right. No, I hate that. <laughs> I hate that too. Speaking of the blues, mm. I want to tell you about our sponsor here, headspace.com slash gig because life can be stressful. Even like in normal circumstances, life can be stressful. And then here we are in 2020 and let's face it. We really don't know what 2021 is going to bring quite yet. So we all need stress relief that goes beyond quick fixes. And this is what headspace is because headspace is our daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in this super easy to use app. I've been a headspace user for years, long before we even knew the, they were interested in sponsorship or anything like that. And this app truly makes it super easy, not only to learn how to meditate if you're new, but also just to stick with your practice. If you've been doing this a while, it really is one of those things that is, has different paths for, you know, beginners versus, I never want to say experts with meditation because it's just a practice, right? But, you know, seasoned med meditators, it's there for you. And really it's great because if you've got, you know, you're feeling stressed out and you've only got a few minutes, they've got things like a three minute SOS meditation that you can just do and then you're good to go. Or if you have trouble falling asleep, they've got meditations for that. They've got meditations to help boost focus. So there's these, it's not just, you know, you're sitting down doing the same thing by yourself. You've got this app to help guide you. It's backed by 25 published studies on its benefits. It's got like 600,000 five-star reviews. And it's because Headspace makes it easy for you to build this life-changing meditation practice on your schedule, anytime, anywhere. And you deserve to feel happier. And Headspace is meditation made simple. So you've got to go to headspace.com slash giggab. That's headspace.com slash giggab. And there you get a free one month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. This is the best deal offered right now. So head to headspace.com slash giggab today. And our thanks to Headspace for sponsoring this episode. All right, Paul, where are you taking us? Well, so here's the thing. We talk, we have some themes that recur and they, they are themes that recur with the art and science of running a band, right? And one of them is the importance of communication. And I, I think one of my tenets of, of uh, what a successful band is, yeah, is everybody being on the same page. And mm. so, and there are many pages and being on all the same pages or as many as you can be. And I was thinking, you know, we had a discussion last week about planning for things to open up again. And just coincidentally, the House Rockers did a nice Zoom check-in on, uh, on Friday night. It was great to see the guys you know, some of them I haven't seen. I've, I've been trying to keep in touch as much as I can. One of the guys has been ill, and, you know, and is recovering now, which was great to see. That's and good. you know, it's just that good thing. And as a little aside, you know, I'm kind of struck that, um, you know, many bands like to think of themselves as family or brothers or, you know, whatever it is. It is kind of an interesting thing because um, you you are people from different backgrounds and different families and different value sets. And, and you come together and you find this thing that works for you. And, and when it's good, it's good. And when it's not, it's heartbreaking. But this, the concept of family is a really interesting thing to hunt, kind of hold up to the light. And that's where this whole issue of communication comes in. So we had a conversation about, about opening up. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different 
um, perspectives about, you know, when someone will get a, a vaccine or, you know, even prognosticating about what will be safe and when will be safe and sure. just kind of talking about what the scene will be like when, when the world opens up again. And I know, uh, you know, most concern to me is that the indoor scene is going to have a lot of challenges. Some of these places will be gone. Many of the places I think will be gone. And one of the guys said, you know, we should, you know, throw our hat in uh, and offer to do some, you know, opening fundraisers, uh, you know, for some of these venues and help them, you know, get their legs back under them. And a couple of interesting thoughts about that. One was, I don't know that one night that we do is really going to change, you know, a, a business that's been without revenue for nine months. Right. Or, you know, by that time, 12 months. Um, you know, but it is a nice thing to do. And, it, you know, if possible, I would be up for it. But I know in my band, We've come to um, a place where after all these years, um, we will we will come to places where I know I can feel things are different. We have a general understanding in the band that um, we'll do a couple of pro bono things a year if it's a good cause. And, and sure. uh, you know, and, you know, money isn't going to other people and we're the only ones giving our time. Right. That would be one of the basics that we talk about. <laughs> we, but we have so the, general, we have a rule in chafe and it's not really a rule, but it's it's a common phrase. Everybody, meaning each band member, everybody gets one a year, you know, so you have a cause that's, that means something to you. You want the band to play for free. That's sure. Good. Go ahead. And, you know, and of course, Jake hasn't you played in a while, but we talk about it. Correct. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I have in my band, you know, five full-time musicians. Yep. Um, and again, we don't really have fights about this stuff. I'll talk about the one that was a pretty, pretty divergent set of pr perspectives and along with those divergent perspectives are I am cautious when I play the leader card. This is for the good of the band. Sure. Um, but the concept of things opening up and, you know, what we'll do for free, um, you know, really kind of, you know, made me think about, you know, what, what do we still agree on? What do we not agree on? Do we need to have another band meeting and just kind of re go through? I, I had a band meeting several years ago and it started um, with a conversation about uh, how far we would go for how much pay. Right. And, okay. um, you know, I, I actually had the guys come in and, you know, anticipating the situation where some guys, you know, will take up all the oxygen in your room and, and sell their position. And some guys are just quiet and aren't going to want to get into the mess of things, wouldn't sell their position. So I actually handed everyone a piece of paper and I said, you know, how much would you do for a gig 50 miles or less, 50 to 100 miles, 100 to 200 miles, 200 miles plus, and just kind of got the consensus. And then, you know, as with everything, I always ask, will you go along with the... Um, majority, you know, I, I need to know that on, at every point because I still think there are some things where some guys will say no, you know, I, I won't do it. And even though the point being, I do have some guys that are full time pros. I over the years have gotten all their time because I book far out in advance, and you know they've gotten a lot from being in a band that works this much and kind of has some local notoriety. And so they they are you know even the pros, and this is mostly you know the, some of the horn players that we worked with. Are now feel as though they're part of a band and have for you know sure past seven eight years right yeah but for a while they were like yeah I'll, you know I'll do the gig first call you know if something else comes up and and I've had guys who would be like hey I haven't done a jazz gig in a while I'm going to sub myself for this I'm like you can't do that the rhythm <laughs> section rhythm section can do that you can't do that so I don't know what you're thinking so the one area that um, we had a harder time that took a lot of communication was we play a lot within. 30 miles. We play around San Jose a lot, right? Sure. That's, that's not great. Like if you want more gigs, you know, build your audience in a, in a larger, more diverse geographic area. So we had an offer to come up for not good money to go up to Sacramento, which is about mm. two hours away. And there was a lot of pushback. Like, you know, I'm, I don't want to go up somewhere. I don't want to drive two hours for, you know, $50 guaranteed plus, you know, some, whatever we may get. Yeah. Right. And we had a whole conversation about the value of, you know, doing what we've done in a few areas down here. We we play a lot in San Jose, but, you know, 40 minutes to the east of us, we've built a good audience and we have we pack a club there. But it took several years to do it. Um, uh, maybe 40 minutes to the north of us, you know, we, we've done pretty good. Not as good as we should. Sure. But it's, it's difficult because, you know, I know that there's like this subtle tension about how much, you know, we can do things for the interest of building the business. And just as we're getting back into um, opening up, 
I think we're going to be presented with those things. Like I said, certainly if we want to take part in the, in the renaissance of indoor clubs, I don't know that the money's going to be there, you know, like it was when we left. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, there's a, probably a whole other conversation to have about that. And it's all just speculation now anyway, but I, I can see a world where eventually there's even more money in the indoor clubs as people, you know, get out of their homes and don't want to be in their homes anymore, you know, and, and maybe there's more interest in live music and just live entertainment with other people than there has been in a long time, but that's not going to be how it is on day one, whatever day, however we define day one, when we get to look exactly. backwards at this, right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that that's going to be the, the tail. That's yeah. not going to be the head. That's going to yeah, be the that's tail. That's the tail. C correct. Yeah. I think, I think within two years, that's how it is. However we get there is probably going to be a little messy as it always is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, the, we had this conversation, you know, these places have gone six, nine, 12 months with no revenue. Yeah. I don't know if they can go 24 months. And I think that it's, it's going to be a wildly different landscape. And the article in the San Francisco Chronicle here was about, you know, those people who you're playing for some of these in, or venues, they are a dying breed of music loyalists who, you know, they run those clubs out of passion projects. Don't assume if they go out of business, that there's another generation of those types of people ready to walk in because it's a tough business. You know, it's, you know, live music for bands is, you know, a, a challenge thing in, in so many venues if you're not in love with it. And so sure. I think the indoor scene is going to change a lot. But the point of all this is, you know, it is time as part of the opening up is to have this really good, frank, honest conversation and get ideas on the table about what your band it will do, won't do, uh, and how you can, you know, maintain the harmony. I mean, have you ever been in that type of situation where, where you, I mean, you've had diverse views of something that affected your time or your wallet, right? So, you know, yep. your band wanted to do something that you didn't want to do because it wasn't a good use of your time and it wasn't justified by a good use of your wallet. I mean, yeah, it, it, it there's always those things to happen, right? It like, I have had theater gigs offered to me where it's like, you know, they want me to do, you know, five nights a weekend for five weekends. And it's like, that's not a good use of my time yeah, or my wallet. Much. It's just too much. Yeah. You're asking too much of me. I do this. I mean, I, I, I take it seriously, but it is, you know, when it, when, if I, if someone were looking from the outside, it's hard for me to say this from in my own head because I know where I prioritize music and it's it's a very different thing than it might look from the outside, right? But looking from the outside, music is very much a hobby in, in that it is not my main profession. Doesn't mean I don't take it seriously. It doesn't mean that it, at times it's not the most important thing to me, yeah. uh, you know, but, but I mean, if someone, you know, we're, it, and to call it a hobby isn't really true. I mean, I make money at it. I, you know, I do treat it like a business. So, you know, but, but it is at best a side business. Let's put it that yeah. way. Right. You know, from, from the standpoint of just brass tacks, it's a side business and, and it's not something these years where I focus on growing it into more than a side business, right? You know, I'm, I'm happy leaving it right where it is ish. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, of course I've had those things where it's just like, yeah, that, that gig's not worth it to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the thing is what happens when the only gigs that are available are gigs that previously would have been fallen into that category of it's not worth it to me. Right. But let me just clarify this. In the theater gigs, you're asked to be one of several contractor. It's not like it's a, a working unit of a band that has a, you know, the, the complexity of having an implied commitment. to Way easier to say no. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Now, you might not get the call the next time, you know, when when you decline, you decline too much. And people say, well, that dude's not available. So I got to call somebody else, you know, and 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 momentum leaves you behind. But yeah, with a with a band and I've been there with bands, too, where it's like, guys, this like, what, what are we doing? Uh, we we had a lot of that go on with Fling as Mike was learning how to book the band. And, you know, I joked about, you know, some places we'd play where we get 12 bucks and nachos or whatever. That, at the end of the night, there were a few gigs that weren't too far off from that. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and it was like, Mike, this isn't worth our, you know, we, we all sat down and we, it wasn't like we were complaining at Mike, but it was like, let's take a look at this objectively here. Is it worth packing up all our stuff and going down there? And what we found was, and, and perhaps this is 
a better metric, better litmus test on this. What we found was that those gigs that didn't pay well or that were otherwise, you know, like you said, not worth it were also just not worth it because they, they, if they didn't pay well, it was usually an indication that they weren't really geared for live music. It was just this thing that they did as an aside. And so there, the people that were there weren't there because of the live music. Cause if they were, then the club would have more money to spend on live music because that's actually part of what their clientele wants. But if they've built this clientele up that doesn't care about live music and now you're shoving live music in the corner for $12 and nachos, that's not a really great fit. For self, self-defeating. It. It's self-defeating. Yeah. It was like, you know, we'd be playing for our $12 and eating our nachos on set break. And, <laughs> and the rest of the, like the crowd would be way over there because they came to this bar to talk to each other. It's like, okay, well, why are we here? And I, and I think that's kind of the thing. This is why I, I rarely mind doing charity gigs. And again, you know, the, the asterisk that you added before, as long as we're not the only ones donating our time, you know, that, that sort of thing. Right. But, um, I never minded doing charity gigs because usually those were gigs where people like were coming to party, but it was a party in, in the name of a charity. And so let's all donate our time. But it, it was a good gig. Like you had a good crowd, like our Mac world all-star band gigs, right? You know, like those gigs, we played them because we loved to be able to play for those people. And, and to be able to do that is, is more important to me than making sure every single gig is highly paid. Yeah. But but in the past, it was a, being well-paid. I don't want to necessarily say highly paid, but being well-paid was a good litmus test for knowing whether it was going to be a good gig or not. And then there is the, you know, the, the important factor of maintaining the cost floor for your, you know, your local market and all of that stuff. Um, but I, that may not be the case as things, you know, during the the beginning of things opening up, it might be, okay, look, you know, we're going to, there's no more guarantees. Even like uh, when we had uh, your friend Brad Maddox on, when he was talking about the, the larger touring industry, and he was saying even the conversation there was that all the guarantees are probably going to be out the window. That was the speculation as to when things open up, right. you know, even, even name brand acts aren't going to be getting the guarantees that they used to. It's going to be, okay, we're all in this together. We're opening up the doors for the first time in a long time in a new world. And let's, let's be in it together. And the difference there, there's really not a ton of difference, except I think there is one major factor. And that is that most working bands that work in clubs don't have the same level of business rep representation as the clubs with whom they're working. When you've got, you know, the Rolling Stones playing at Giant Stadium, both of those organizations know how to run their businesses. And the people that are negotiating for how that let's all be in this together formula works know how to do that negotiation, right? That's, that's a good point. And whereas, you know, you've got someone that's truly running a business of, of running a, a club, and then you've got a band that just wants to get out and play, and some bands have people that are better at business than others, but it's not a guaranteed part of the formula. And when it's not a guaranteed part of the formula, let's say it's a part of the formula for 15% of the bands out there that, you know, 15% sure. of them have somebody that knows what they're doing. Well, that means that you're fighting against what the other 85% are out there agreeing to all day long. And, and that gets frustrating. So it, yeah, they're the, like the, the, pie in the sky idea of we're all in this together is great. And I, I fully support that. Like it is going to be a new world. We got to figure it out together, but we need to make sure everybody's being fair to each other. And when you have different skills, different business, different levels of business acumen, um, you know, uh, in each side of this negotiation, it's just not going to work out being fair. Most of the time, it's not well, what you said that really kind of resonates with me is, you know, like you said, and chafed, everybody gets one a year chafed or fling. Uh, it was chafed, but, but fling, we basically had the same policy. Right. Yeah. I like that a lot. And I actually think, again, if it's a leader led band, you know, that is one of the things you should have in your conversation. Mm -hmm. I need you guys to let me pick X amount of things per year that I want to do because I think that they are really strategically good for the band. Yeah. And you, and I want you guys to be on, you know, on board with that. You know, it's, you don't want to go down the path of, 
and, and I know this as a leader, and especially in the early days of the House Rockers, I was just so happy to be playing. I would take a lot of stuff that wasn't great situations just to play. And I think, you know, in, in a lot of bands, semi-professional bands, um, you know, the leader probably has a little bit more, you know, he's taken on the role of, of doing the booking because, it, you know, it's meaningful to him. Sometimes it's, it's meaningful financially, but often it's meaningful, you know, that he, he wants to play. And he might see an opportunity in things that other players might not. So getting that out on the table, like, you know, there's a couple things. I think this is good. Here's the strategy I'd like you to buy in. And then, you know, that's a frustrating thing when they don't buy in. So then you got to figure out, you, you know, do I sub? Right. And do I want to have, you know, a different team that goes with me on gigs that are 100 miles away? How do I make it right to those guys when it's, you know, do I find local guys up there for subs? Yeah. You know, that's that. Then you're kind of fussing around your brand. Then it's then it's a different thing. It's a different thing. That's right. Yes. Yeah. It's a very different thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Conversation. yeah. No, it's, it, it's it's communication. Yeah. I you know, this is why I, I wish there was a way to solve this problem. And, and truly, I know that no one, most people involved on the bar side and on the band side, you know, just to, to really break it down. I know that most people involved don't want to exploit the other, right? There's some that are, that do, and, and th it's pretty easy to identify those to be fair, right? Most people are just like the bar owners trying to run their business. You know, they want to have live music. They want to do the right thing, but they may not even know what the right thing is because they don't they don't understand what a band needs and most bands aren't very good at articulating what they need. So how could, you know, somebody on the other side of this, unless they've been there and it's really obvious when you show up at a club that is run by someone that is, or was a working musician, you know, the, like the sound gear is set up the way it should yep. be. Right. Like it's, it's painfully obvious when you get one versus Absolutely. the other. Yeah. And it's great, you know, but it's, it's not the, it's the exception, not the rule. And that makes sense. These people are, you know, restaurateurs, and that's a whole different business. And if you think being in the music business is tough, man, try food service. That is something mm. I like stay far away. But, um, I, you know, it, I, I don't think they want to, treat anyone unfairly but if a band just shows up and says yes without saying i need this can we talk usually i need this can we talk is an okay thing in business uh you know it it opens that conversation but most bands don't feel confident having that level of discussion i don't even want to say negotiation uh, and that defines our industry. It has defined our industry for decades. Without a doubt. And, and so, you know, if, if you've learned one thing listening to the show, it's, it's okay when somebody says, I want you to come and play, uh, you know, $250 for your 10 piece band and, and you play from 7 PM to 2 AM with no breaks. Sound good. You know, they aren't, they aren't saying that to, to be unrealistic or unfair to you. They're saying it because they don't know what you need them to know. And, and it's okay to say, Hey, can we talk through the logistics of this? There's a couple of things I need in order to make this work for us. And most people, I mean, remember these people are in business. They are in business all day well, long. I'll, I'll tell you what, yeah. especially again in the semi-professional space, yeah. some of the problem here is what gets, what gets complicated by having you know, weekend bands that will play for free or nothing just to have a gig to show up for their friends. Right. Those are the people who teach bad, bad bar owners, you know, that, that unreasonable is okay. They'll, yes. they'll take unreasonable, you know, just to have a gig. And that's what complicated it for the professionals. Correct. Yeah. Cause the bar owner is like, well, well, nobody else has complained about this. You know, it's like, right. yeah, I, I know, but can just, you know, hear me out. And this is where, Pers interpersonal skills, negotiation, all of that stuff is valuable to have, you know, where you can sit down with somebody. And I always say, you know, if you feel like you're on the, uh, whether I'm not talking physically, I'm talking, you know, sort of uh, virtually here. If you feel like you are on the opposite sides of the table from someone, it's going to fail, right? You need to be on the same side of the table. Like here we are both shoulder to shoulder approaching that problem over there. Right. Good advice. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it, you know, thinking in that mindset has changed me in my life in so many ways. It's like, how do we solve this problem together? And it, and it, you can even acknowledge, maybe there is no way for us to, to get to where we both need to be together, but let's see what we can do together. 
And, and when you approach it that way with a club owner or frankly, with anyone in any kind of business you're doing, it's okay, right? You just like, oh, let's, okay, let me listen to you. You're going to listen to me. Ah, I didn't know you needed those things. When you say it that way, it makes sense. I had no idea that, you know, your drummer needs to have this kind of space. But now that you explain it, it makes perfect sense, yep. <laughs> right? You know, they don't know that what is, that's you- That's good advice. They don't know what you don't, what you haven't told them necessarily, unless they've done it enough to know. So, yeah. I don't know. So anyway, communication, you know, as part of your opening up exercises with talking to your market, which is what we talked about last time, talking to your band and what, what your, what they, what everybody thinks opening up is going to look like and, you know, what opportunities are going to go for together? What opportunities are you willing to give a little bit more? Right. What is this a time, you know, like you said, things are going to be different. Is this a good time for you to get into some different markets because everything's changed and the slate is clean for a lot of people? And is everybody in your band on board with going into some different markets? Right. You know, do you want to be a wedding band? Do you want to be a corporate band? Do you want to play, you know, in the next big city, you know, that might be two hours away? So all those are good conversations to have and uh, make sure that your band stays on the same page about it. Yeah. And just and, and read the market. Right. You know, be I think it's good to start having these conversations with your band now because the opportunities that will exist might be something we don't predict, sure. right? So having the, the conversation about, okay, here's what we know existed in the past. Which of these things would we be comfortable doing now when, you know, some, you know, oddball thing comes up that turns out to be the new normal for a little while. Okay. Well, does that fit into what we want to do? How are we, we've, we already know how to have this conversation. So now let's take that skill and have this conversation about that. And yeah, maybe we can, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can't, but at least we, we aren't figuring out how to talk with each other uh, when that comes up. So, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be crazy though, man. It's uh, I, I, I'm very eager to see, I'm eager to see <laughs> what happens with the scene. I'm e I like, I'm eager to find out what bands I am playing with a year from now. Yeah. Like that. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, and I'm eager to find out. I know I'll be a material participant in making these decisions. <laughs> it's not like I think it's going to happen to me, but the but you just where it changes in the air, changes in the air. I, I, yeah, I can't control it. So I'm more leaning in on, okay, well, what's going to happen? Like you said, changes in the air. I like it. That's maybe that's the, uh, maybe that's the title of the episode right there. So I like it. Yep. All Thanks, right. Brother. Thanks, uh, folks, for listening. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We love getting your feedback in and all of that good stuff. It makes uh, it makes the show that much more interesting for all of us. So that's what I got, man. Hope you have a good week, Paul. Right. Yeah, you too, Dave. Rock on and happy holidays. Thanks to Headspace and uh, everybody. Always be performing. Always, always. Always.